afternoon and thank you for joining us for our National Library Week celebration focusing on conservation. Today we will be focusing on the local wildlife of green, green country and the conservation initiatives that are in place to protect these populations. We are honored to have Mr. Robert Gibbs, Conservation Educator Coordinator for the Rogers County Conservation District with us. He develops and delivers numerous conservation, biology, and botany educational programs on the RSU Conservation Reserve. Please welcome Mr. Robert Gibbs. Y'all gonna have to pay attention. All right, um, thanks for having me here today. The couple of things I wanna start with is first off conservation and where conservation districts come from. Um, most people remember back to the Dust Bowl and the Dirty 30s, but what led into that? At that time there was a federal organization, the Soil Erosion Service, and they were headed by a gentleman by the name of Hugh Hammond Bennett, a uh, wonderful man, far thinker ahead of everybody else. And he knew that soil as one of our natural renewable resources was a threatened thing. And he was working to try and get the general public to understand that. And his agency was on a temporary budget that was about to run out. So he was trying to figure out how to make that a permanent situation. While all that was happening, we were experiencing a little bit of a drought in this part of the country, a little thing of the depression going on, and we had the Dust Bowl going on. Dust Bowl was devastating to a lot of areas, but if you weren't in this area, you may not have understood just how big of a problem it was. Uh, Mr. Bennett, being a far thinker, had scheduled a meeting to talk to the Joint Houses of Congress and fight for permanent funding for his agency, federal agency, and to get the word out. Um, unbeknownst to Congress, he was also talking with people in the center part of the country and knew that one of those huge dust clouds had caught the jet stream and was headed up through the Ohio Valley towards Washington, D.C. Winds were carrying it, not quite as fast as he wanted, so he kind of ducked out of the first day and said we'll reschedule for the next day and he's in front of Congress telling them how important conservation is, telling them how important soil erosion can be and about the climax of his presentation the dust cloud rolled in and darkened the Capitol and as it came through the windows and started settling on their desks he said gentlemen that is the center part of the United States, and that is a problem we have to fix. From that, and then Black Sunday, a couple more little events happened, Congress passed permanent front funding, and um, the Soil Conservation Service was started as a permanent federal agency, later turned in the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is our federal partner we work with as well. Those gentlemen also noticed that with such a problem, they could not fix all the problems. We had to do it ourselves because the farmers and ranchers and, and people that lived out here were the ones responsible for what was going on. And instead of the government telling them what they had to do, local forms of government were started, conservation districts. In conservation districts, we have 84 now in Oklahoma, but doesn't matter where you live in Oklahoma or the United States, you are in a conservation district. In Oklahoma, they're set up like a school district. We've got a uh, you know, school district is run by a five-member school board. Our local conservation districts are run by a five-member board. Ours are a little different because three are elected and two are appointed by the governor. Um, and like I said, we have 84 conservation districts in Oklahoma and only having 77 counties. This eastern part of the state, central part of the state, we are on county boundaries. And I'm with the Rogers County Conservation District. There's a Mays County, Nowata, Tulsa County. You get over into western Oklahoma, there may be two or three districts covering up part of a county due to different watersheds and that sort. Um, just because I'm with the Rogers County doesn't mean I stay here. I travel out of the county to do programs, and I get a lot of people from out of the county coming to us uh, for programs. But conservation was started as that little local bit of landowners. We're not regulatory. Um, we don't try to do that. What we try to do is educate the public to understand why they need to conserve or use wisely those natural renewable resources. We know plants, animals, soil, water, and air 
our five natural renewable resources that we have to have to survive today, but if we want to be around here tomorrow, we got to make sure there's still some of them left. So it's a resource we use on a daily basis, we just have to learn to use it wisely. And we've been working at that since the 30s. Rogers County Conservation District actually started in the 40s. Um, but we've been busy at a lot of different things. And we worked with landowners, pasture management, um, crop rotations, animal livestock, ponds, things of that sort, which we still do on a regular basis. Um, but Rogers County kind of went a little bit further and back in 1989, they went into an agreement with uh, Rogers Junior College and decided that some of that property left from when this was Oklahoma Military Academy be used as an educational facility. The, our board and the, the Dr. Mosier and them all got together, started talking and said, okay, you guys make it where it'll be open to the public seven days a week, sun up to sundown to enjoy the resources that are there. Use it as a classroom for people of Northeast Oklahoma and around and we'll keep the lights on and the water running down there in your buildings. And we have been doing that since 1989. Um, I came aboard in 2001. Uh, at that time, they were doing a lot of education programs, but one of the things they wanted to do was take it a little step further and make it more curriculum-based for a lot of those school districts so that their field trips were important um, and do a little more outreach to the civic groups. So we started doing programs uh, and now I'm probably running six to 8,000 teachers and students a year through my programs at the reserve. And then we have unknown thousands that come through the gates every day to walk the trails, walk their dogs, push the baby strollers, um, take photographs and things of that sort, which is something we enjoy people being able to do. But by putting that on the ground and showing people, that's what I try to do. Um, before you're gonna wanna conserve something, before you're gonna wanna take care of something, you gotta understand a reason for it. And with today's technology, we can learn all we wanna learn about Australia or Africa. But too many times we're forgetting what's in our own backyard. We don't go out there to see what's there. We don't know our natural resources that we have. So I try to use that 100 acres as a living classroom to show people what we have and how it's important and why we want to try to save it. We get a lot of students coming down there. We have some research going on down there from the students here. Um, and the public seems to enjoy it quite well. We just try to push it a little bit more with a little understanding of different things. Try to show them something different about an organism or a plant. Why do we need this? Why do we not want something else? One of the things we deal with are invasive species, whether it be plant or animal. Down on the reserve, one of the things we deal with are plants, and we've got a couple of different ones. Uh, the eastern red cedar is something that's a big problem in this part of the state, native to the western part of the state, but over in this part it does become an invasive species. For years we'd have different ways of combating that problem and dealing with it, um, and our agency works with federal agencies to show landowners how to do it. What we try to do at the reserve is show that it is a problem, what that problem can be sometimes, so we leave some to show that it can be a, a, an impact on native wildlife because of the overshading and the taking up of the water for a lot of our native plants, but then you also have to show that it does do some good because anything you look at has both positive and negative impacts. While it does serve as shelter for a lot of wildlife, it does serve as a food supply for a lot of wildlife, it does take away some of those native plants that we had in our prairie ecosystem when it starts to become a forested ecosystem. So we work with that, try to show landowners, okay, if you've got cedars encroaching, here's how we can take care of them. And we work with our federal partners to try and do that. Um, another one we have isn't so much that it was spread by the birds with wildlife, but it was one of those ones that was brought in by people as an ornamental for their backyard, and that's Asian privet and Asian honeysuckle. Both of those brought in as a nice ornamental um, and in their proper position, they do great, but anything left unchecked can cause a problem. 
Um, they're one of those ones that produce a lot of seeds within, within those berries. The birds love to eat them and they spread them everywhere. And now we've got to come around with a way to combat that invasive species before it takes over. So those are some things that we try to do in just a passive way for the general walkers and, and people out there. We also um, keep a butterfly garden going. Uh, pollinators and butterfly gardens, something most every homeowner wants to deal with. They want to have a butterfly garden or pollinators in their garden. So we try to show through passive gardens part of that so that we can show them some of the plants that you can put out there, some of the ways you can make some natural native pollinator gardens as well as some that are um, more ornamental plants brought in for pollinator gardens. We also, with the luxury of being 100 acres of Oklahoma <laughs> flora and fauna, we can show those plants to become the food supply for the rabbits, for the deer, and the woodchucks, and which ones you've got to do to try and keep them from eating all of them, because that's another thing uh, that we work with, is, is dealing with Oklahoma wildlife and how that is. Many times we try to work with other agencies, not only our federal partners in RCS, uh, we work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for a lot of their stuff for habitat re-enhancement and for habitat uh, mitigation when, when a corporation's fine for causing a problem. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service tries to get some people to help re-establish an area uh, to compensate for that. So we've worked with them. We're going to be putting in some more pollinator gardens this year um, to help with that and to work with the monarchs and the monarch watch that everybody goes through. Everybody picks some, you know, there's certain little animals or buzzwords or something that will get everybody going. Um, everybody likes mammals, little warm fuzzy guys, especially if they're black and white, that, and except for the skunks. Um, but that's something most people love and they'll get behind. Uh, it's kind of hard to get somebody behind a bee um, if it's not a honey bee that's giving them um, honey. Um, so you gotta find something, so the monarch has become a big powerhouse for the pollinator and pollinator gardens. It's a butterfly that people recognize and they can all go, okay, that's something I wanna see flying around so we need to learn to take care of it. And we try to then take that species and let it be the lead as we help preserve the other pollinators that are out there and conserve their habitat so that they will survive and continue to do all that they do for us as agricultural and as just pleasing to go out and sit in the yard and see the butterflies or see the moths at night, and understand the differences between them and things of that sort. So we work with those agencies for that. The trick is trying to pull a species that people will get behind because sometimes a bat may not be something everybody wants to say, oh, we need a lot more of those, or maybe a salamander is not exactly what somebody wants, or you know, even a snake. So we try to find some species that people will hook onto, enjoy and understand, then we can pull those others in. And unfortunately, in today's time, many of our youth um, aren't used to growing up in an outdoor rural type of area. We are becoming more and more uh, urbanized and Tulsa is just continuing to grow and Broken Arrow and Jinx. So for us to be able to provide right here in, in Rogers County and Claremore on the RSU campus a place where I can have a busload of kids come from Broken Arrow and if I want to teach them some of the concepts they're learning in class like life cycles I can take them out on the reserve, talk about life cycles, show them a wetlands that's got frogs in there, that's got tadpoles swimming around, that's got toads along the edge, and say, okay, here's how some guys do go through the big change. They metamorphosize, and we get all the vocabulary in there that's supposed to be there, but we can sit those kids down on that boardwalk and they can be immersed in there and hear the frogs and toads sing and see the tadpoles swimming around, see the birds coming by, and then they go, okay, this is something that I would like to have and I can understand why there's a reason for this. So we can get them hooked in by showing them something like that. Um, move on up and you start wondering about water and water quality. That's something we all worry about because we only have so much water and we've got to do what we can. Nobody wants to take a shower with chunky stuff coming out of the spigots. So what can we do for that? So we try to do a lot of different water quality. We talk about erosion. We talk about the volume of water running off the parking lots and buildings up here on campus 
And where it goes? Well, it heads to the reserve and it takes everything with it. Well, if we've got a working wetlands there, it's going to catch that flood water, hold it back, hold it there for the plants and animals that live and survive there to be able to tap into it. Wetlands are also a great filter system, so it filters everything that's coming down with it. And as we have actually a three-tier system down there, we can filter that water on three levels before it ever leaves the RSU campus. So we've done our part for that. And we can take a high school class down there and do some, pull some water samples, run some water chemistry, talk about that then maybe put some people in hip boots and you get out in the water and you start looking at the live macroinvertebrates that live in the water and those things that most people don't see down in there but once you start seeing those guys you go okay these are important and if we don't have good water quality if we keep throwing stuff on the ground and dumping things into the water system these guys will disappear and here's why we don't want that to happen and not everybody may be used to getting up close and personal with a dragonfly larva, um, but you'd ra much rather see one of those than a mosquito larva in the water. One of those dragonfly larvae are eating the mosquito larva, so there are beneficial predator out there. So we talk about that and let the students get up close and personal with some of that life in the water that they did not know was there. A lot of people see a big body of water and they think, okay, I can go bass fishing there. Well, that's great, but before you can get the bass, you have to have something for the bass to eat. You have to have something for that animal to eat. You have to have something for that animal to have eaten, and all that ties back into the water quality. So we can pull a lot of that together and show how everything out there is interconnected, how everything out there fits together and why each part of that is important. Um, and if we can do that and get one of them to just go, okay, that makes a little more sense to me, that's something, then we, we were, we're doing our part because we're getting them to take that back home and go, okay, I want one of these around where I live. I want a little body of water in the backyard with the flowers around it and dragonflies buzzing around in the afternoon. Those are things that if we can start that spark, then we're achieving it. And that's where we try to go. That's where the Rogers County Conservation District tries to go with that reserve down there. And through those organized classes, we are able to reach a lot of people, and not just from right here in Claremore or Rogers County. Um, I had a group come down from Barnstall the other day. I mentioned Broken Arrow and Jinx and uh, Bixby all come up. I've got groups from Oklahoma City that will drive up here for the programs and the things that we can offer right here in Claremore that they can't get in other places. Uh, that shows that we're doing something right and we're getting out there and getting the point out to people and people understand that. And if you've got a good program, they're gonna come to it. So we're, we're very fortunate with that. And through all of those education programs, that allows us to spider web out because I will get a group come in and a parent or a grandparent will come as a volunteer and go, well, I lived in Claremore all my life. I didn't know that was back there. I thought that was just woods back behind there before you got to the golf course. Um, and when they start realizing how many miles of trails are out there to walk on, the fact that we do 5K runs out there to help support the memorial across the street. Um, those are things that, that they didn't realize was happening right here in their town. And we get a lot of new people out there for that. Anytime you start creating something like that, there's always that little double-edged sword with it because everybody loves the nice, quiet little area to go walk through. And many times you get on the trails and forget you're in the middle of Claremore till you hear a train whistle. Um, but then when you start talking to people and say, okay, we want to help get more people out here, they're like, no, no, don't tell anybody because we want to keep this just for ourselves and we don't want more people out here walking. Well, <laughs> fortunately it's big enough we're not going to get that overrun with people. Um, but we love the fact that the, the locals around here that are out here on a regular basis, our regulars, they take ownership in it and they'll let us know if something's going on. Um, we're still working on some of the new ones that come through because occasionally you'll get new people come through and I know they're coming down there because it's a nice place to go and nature's there and it's beautiful. I just can't figure out why they leave their drink cups and their lunch sacks behind with them after they leave. So we're, we're still working on that part of it. Um, and the regulars sometimes don't like that when somebody's messing up their area, but they let us know when things like that are happening um, so we can get in there and take care of that and keep it a place uh, that Claremore can be proud of, Northeast Oklahoma can be proud of uh, with all that we do and to continue that conservation message, to, to let people know, 
yes, we have natural resources out there. Yes, we can conserve and use those resources wisely. And no, we don't have to regulate and fine and all of that stuff. Um, conservation districts discovered years ago, you give somebody the tools and let them understand why something's important, they will work to preserve that. If they don't understand why it's important, they're not going to. And if you come out and say, if you don't do this, this is going to happen to you, well, that's a problem. But if you say, you know, hey, if you continue down the road, you could have these problems or you make these little conservation changes and this is what you'll benefit from. Whether it be stopping soil erosion, running too many cows on a pasture, having them all go to one pond instead of having multiple paddocks where you can rotate graze and have multiple water sources, working on native species versus non-native species to get there. You know, the prairies lasted for years and years out here um, with our tall grasses and to get some of those back get rid of some of those eastern red cedars, get rid of some of that privet and start having our big tall grass system come back. We were a little more of the Cherokee Prairie, but it still had those tall grasses in there. Big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, and you get all the forbs down in there. And that's what makes that ecosystem that all those organisms survive in. So not only will you have the butterflies flying in there, but you may have a big old hispid cotton rat come through there, and you may have a big old rat snake go through there, and you may have a hawk come by there. But all of those fit together in that ecosystem. And while Everybody might not like all the parts. Once you start seeing how all those parts fit together, that gives you a better understanding of it. And you can tolerate a couple of those as long as they're not up close and personal with you and stand back a little bit and watch the others. And we've been very fortunate here. Um, we've got great water quality through our wetlands and filtration system. We've got great ecosystems out there. And the diversity of wildlife is unbelievable. And that's something most people don't realize. When you go someplace, if you only see one thing, that's probably not a good place to be. Because the more living things that are surviving in an ecosystem, the better it is. So you gotta understand all the levels of the ecosystem and how you need those guys living in the soil, those guys living on the ground, those guys up in the bushes and the ones up in the tall trees. And you gotta have those layers of canopy in there to get all those organisms surviving. So when you're out there, you're not just seeing a monarch butterfly. You're seeing multiple species of animals. You may just see tracks. Um, you may see where one was eating. You may see some scat that one of them left, but you start getting an overall view of the diversity that's out there in an area like that. And then you look at some of those little guys and say, okay, why is that important? What's he doing? What's he doing that makes him special for that area? Why is it important that we keep something like that? And those are things we try to get through, whether it's through the direct classes or just the general public coming through with signage that they can see and interpret what's out there for them, um, trying to drive in that, that basic thing of we've got our natural resources, we need to conserve them or use them wisely. All right, how am I doing with time? Um, I kind of brought a, a little selection of some different skins and skulls that you may see an animal of, you may see some parts of. You, it's not uncommon to be out in the woods and find a skull somewhere and go, okay, what was that? Or to see a hide or see an animal and not completely know what it is. So most all of these guys are just from right around this area. Um, and each one, whether it be a coyote or a bobcat or a possum, uh, each one has some unique characteristics, whether you're looking at the head with the teeth. If you've got all the teeth, you can tell exactly um, what it is. Most people um, may not be too fond of a possum. Um, you never want to stick your hand in a feed sack with a possum because once you start looking at the teeth of a possum, you begin to realize they've got 50 teeth, okay? They mean business. And each of those teeth tell us what they eat and how they eat it and how they survive. So you can compare a uh, possum's teeth to a bobcat. Bobcat, pure carnivore. He doesn't have those teeth. He doesn't need to be munching on seeds or munching on something like that because this bobcat's a pure carnivore. So you can look at that and see what's going on with that versus something um, oops, like our groundhog or woodchuck. We get a lot of these guys running around out here. This time of year, you'll start seeing mom with her babies behind them. 
Um, they've got a big bushy tail. A lot of people will call them a bushy tailed beaver. Um, the woodchuck or groundhog, great little guy, runs around out there, sits up on its back haunches like a little prairie dog, but he's a pure herbivore, so he doesn't have some of those teeth. So you can see his teeth, see what he's doing. He's got nice white incisors, so he's eating on soft plant material. He's not chewing on something like a porcupine or a beaver. So you can learn some from that. Science always trying to figure out what's there and see what's there so we can't evaluate one of those ecosystems. And you may see a skull every once in a while. You may see some scat every once in a while from these animals. But the other thing is, how do I tell what else is there? Well, there's some great science ways of doing that. Um, one of the things is we let wildlife do the work for us and we just kind of come through and clean because predators will consume the prey that's around them. Owls and birds of prey are great at that they're gonna find a lot of those little mammals and different animals out there that we don't typically see. And as they consume them, owls are very efficient with what they do. Swallow those things whole, bones, fur, teeth, toenails, feathers go over here, the rest of that stuff's digested, and then about once a day, they'll cough it up as a big old pellet. And then we can take those pellets apart, dig in there, find the bones of what they've been eating, identify them because we know each one of those little mammals has a different tooth pattern. And then from that, we can build a diversity study of what's out there. Kids love to do this. Um, scientists do this on a regular basis. It's their way of doing an inventory. And then you can take that to the next level and articulate it and put it back together if you've got patience to put a jigsaw puzzle back together when you may not have all the pieces. Um, but by doing things like that, we're able to see a little more of what's out there, see it on a different level, and it gets the students up and involved. And now pellets is one I like to do with them because it does get them up close and personal with things to be able to explore and see what's out there in an area that they may not have seen um, just cruising around. Also, we try to get the students involved uh, in other ways. There's a lot of citizen science going around now where you're actively involved in the conservation, whether it's in your backyard or around. I mentioned putting in pollinator gardens or butterfly gardens. Um, birding is a big thing. We work with the wildlife department. We've got nest boxes that we check on a regular basis down on the reserve to take part of their nest box survey. Um, we help the public get some nest boxes out there and get them involved with doing that. The wildlife department's also big on backyard bird feeder surveys and the winter bird count. For the backyard bird survey, that's just the general person looking out their back window and seeing what birds are coming to the feeders at that particular time. And then they can take that information, send it to the wildlife department and say, okay, here's what I saw. And that lets the wildlife department get a better view of what's going on because they can't have somebody all over the state all the time. But that information can go back to their biologist and they can take what those citizen scientists have done and put it together and have an impact that way. So um, by doing things like that, uh, there's always some uh, bio blitz going on for those that really want to get out and do that. And maybe birds isn't what you like, but maybe you're a plant person, maybe you're a tree person, maybe you're a salamander person. Um, and you can go out and work with scientists and take inventories of different areas. But we work very hard to get the public involved and get them going and let them see that, yes, they can make an impact just by putting a feeder up in their backyard, just by putting a little flower garden in. They're gonna start taking care of those pollinators, get some of those native plants out there. Right now, the, the red bud is blooming beautiful. It's our state tree that everybody recognizes right now. They won't recognize it in a few weeks once it loses its blooms, but uh, that red bud's a great indicator of how everything fits together and it's feeding our early pollinators right now and giving them that food source and then it's going to provide foods for our seed eating birds in the winter, but it all ties together with our spring rains. So by letting people see that and how just having a little red bud in their yard, um, some flower bed around there maybe put up a bird feeder or two and you can start attracting wildlife, see what's there and enjoy what's there and have your own little niche of nature right there with you. But it starts with trying to understand what's out there now, figuring out what we can learn from it, learn something special and unique about them and go, okay, that's why I want to keep that. That's why I want to save that. Maybe that's why I want this particular type of wildflower blooming because it is a beautiful native flower, whether it's our state wildflower, um, or some of the more common ones like the coneflower and things of that sort. So, what's in the case? 
The case is actually, I took bones from owl pellets and put them in the case for a display so you can see some more of what you might find in there. And then I also had uh, some beetles clean up some of the skeletons so there could be, so that's kind of a little small intricate skeletons in there. I've got some beetles that feed on flesh, um, not live flesh, dead flesh, and they help clean up uh, the material on there. Um, everybody hears the American burying beetle, which is an endangered species. That's not what I have. Um, my little domestic, uh, they just, they do a good job, but it, it lets me get some nice clean bones for people to see. So when the kids are doing owl pellets, they can see what they might find in there, see how they are all different. And this is one of those things, you start seeing what's in the display case, and it's like, oh, okay, now I wanna go in there and dig and see what's in that owl pellet. What can I find in there? What's unique in there for me? It's another one of those dangling carrots to get people excited and involved. Um, you talked a lot about <clears throat> some of the passive education that you have out in the reserve, and as well as bringing in like school children groups. Do you ever schedule anything that's just like an open day to the public where you're out there? We do those. Everything we do since we don't have technology down on the reserve, we run everything through our website. Um, it's a big long one, but it's government, so I didn't use an acronym. It's Rogers County Conservation District.org. People can contact us through there. We use that big for our scheduling for teachers and stuff. Scout groups come a lot. I do a lot of badges for Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts. I have Boy Scouts do Eagle projects out on the reserve to help with the reserve and help them towards their projects. Um, civic groups, I'll talk to those. Occasionally we will do a program out there on butterfly gardens or native birds or winter birds and that's always publicized on our website and then if people have a question about one and they would like something they can email us through that website or just see us out there and let us know and we'll start looking to schedule with some of that. Um, kind of want to open it up to any questions anybody else has. Um, if anybody online wants to ask a question this is a good time. Um, you can just type in we can answer or we can ask any questions for you. Do you guys have any questions? Um, what are some other ways that um, that people can get involved in conservation? Uh, maybe helping out um, the uh, the district in particular. We do use volunteers, and we get several students um, on campus that have to have community service volunteers down there. Um, the Girl Scouts have put in a couple of little flower areas of bulbs and stuff for us when they were working on some of their conservation volunteer practice hours. Uh, if somebody wanted to do was real involved with water and water chemistry uh, our state agency operates a program called blue thumb which is a volunteer monitoring program where they monitor a body of water test the chemistry of it and look for invertebrates and those cool little guys living under the rocks on a regular basis to let us know water quality um, so anything like that but we do need people down there every once in a while like any state agency we've been cut back quite severely at times. Um, I still have a place to go and work, so I'm still pretty happy. But at one time, we had five full-time employees, three full-time people on that reserve, and now I've got two full-time employees, myself and one other, to not just handle the reserve and the education, but also to handle our office and do landowner and uh, pasture management and implement some of our state cost share programs where we help the public put in a pond or cross fencing and pasture management and things like that. So our resources kind of got pulled tight, so anytime we can have a volunteer come out there that would like to help. Um, most of our volunteer stuff, we actually run through our federal uh, partners, NRCS, and they have an Earth Team volunteer program. And in fact, I have a young lady that's going to school here now that was an Earth Team volunteer back in her home county when she was a high school student, came here and she could just pick right up with her Earth Team hours because she wanted to uh, continue what she had been doing at her local conservation district now and here in Rogers County since she's come. So um, anytime we can get some things like that, that's, that's always wonderful.